Welcome to the Film and Steins, the Double Feature Podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level. For the $5 tier, we grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film Steins, where our movies are more than just entertainment their inexperience their inexperience all around yeah. and welcome back to another episode of the film steins thank you guys for joining us today today i am joined by my ball loving friend lucy <laughs> hello everyone Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with brand new episodes of The Film Assigned. Some recent episodes include Civil War 1917, Amazon's new series, Fallout, Problemista, and The Revenant. Remember, leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come request a movie. Come subscribe. Pretty please. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we are discussing Luca Guadagnino's 2024 film challengers i just wanted to start off by saying that i believe we have our first best picture nom for the oscars this year or at the very least for best director because i want to say this is the most directed movie i think i've ever seen in my life this is a class a example of what direction means in film i think this film is awesome from stem to stern, I'm going to go on the record and say that Luca is entering the pantheon of my favorite directors, because this is the fourth banger. Who knew you could tie the meta sensation and even addiction of something like sex to tennis and express it through a probably the most dynamic three-way kind of love triangle I've ever seen in any scenario. We were the only ones to see this at the theater. You and me were the only ones in the whole room. <laughs> so I can't ask anyone else. <laughs> How do you feel about this movie? This movie was very mid for me. It was definitely a sexy movie. It wasn't like the Magic Mikes or like the Fifty Shades of Grey or, you know, those like Step It Up movies or, you know, those those kinds of movies. But more like... Almost like a high school raunch, but still is kind of tasteful. Yeah. Almost like a um, dirty dancing. Mm, yes. I got some Call Me By Your Name vibes. Totally. Even maybe I would dare say putting Moonlight in a kind of sexy, but not all up in your face way. And I like that. I appreciated that about it. I did like a lot of the acting and I mean, the style, everything you said about the direction I completely agree with. I love the style of this movie, but I I don't know. There's not much else I can say about it besides it looked good. I had issues with the pacing. All those slow-mos were overkill. There were way too many of them. I didn't really understand the message, the point, the themes here. Okay, something about relationships and dreams, friendships. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a love triangle for me. And I don't know, maybe I need to look up the definition of a love triangle because something like Twilight is considered a love triangle, but I don't see it as a love triangle. Clearly, Edward's in love with Bella. Clearly, Bella's in love with Edward. Jacob's there just to catch her when she's at her vulnerable, which... I think is something that happened here. 
I think it was very clear who was in love with whom. And maybe I dare say that there was just one guy <laughs> waiting in the background, waiting to catch her at her weakest moment. And that's when he got the girl. I don't know. That's maybe still something I'm trying to work out in my head. You know, um, maybe we can unpack it here about what this this love triangle is supposed to be. Maybe that is what a love triangle is. I don't know. <laughs> so, All right, so there's a lot to unpack there. And I just wanted to preface it with a really kind of interesting point. This was written by Celine Song's husband, who was the director and writer of Past Lives. Uh... And it reminded me a lot of Past Lives and its complexity and and kind of having to read into the dynamics a little bit more. Less of the character and more of what they want out of each other. I thought that was like wild. Yeah, that's too much work for me. I might have a writer couple that I'm really into. And the writer has another movie coming out soon called Queer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll probably only watch that because you'll make me watch that. But I'm obviously not a fan here. It's also going to be directed by Luca. So, oh. yeah, slam dunk. I don't know, though, because I really liked Call Me By Your Name. I thought that one was sweeter in a lot of ways than this movie. It was more still, of a proper coming of age. Yeah, and I mean, still less sexual. Arguably more. I, I wouldn't disagree with yeah. you. But it just felt so much sweeter. Yeah, the innocence to it, too. Yeah. And I, I like that one a lot better than this movie. Even though I feel like this movie had a lot of style that Call Me By Your Name didn't have. Yeah. But just something about Call Me By Your Name spoke to me a lot more. And Bones and All, I really, really like that movie. Excellent film, yeah. But I don't know if I've seen his other movies. I know he did Suspiria. He did the remake, yeah. Is that the one you watched? Yes, with the dancers. Yes, and the witches and all that. We I did not like that. that awesome. Was weird. That movie. was too weird. I was like, what is going One on? One of my favorite horror films. But I also thought, you know, but I also watched it while I was drifting to sleep. And you know, I don't like watching things that are going <laughs> to interfere in my dreams before I go to sleep. That movie, kind of like this, has such an interesting slow burn. It's so weird. It's fun. Yeah, I'm still trying to. I'm still trying to learn from those types of movies because they're still slow for me the slow and teasing nature of this film is also extremely important and i want to start off by talking about this love triangle a love triangle is kind of funny because it's usually because it usually goes in one direction you have your your point and then your two legs kind of pointing towards the point right they don't point out of each other, and a lot of times the point doesn't point at either of the other ones, too. It's usually two people chasing an individual, and they're just kind of maybe beating around the bush playing hard to get. Okay. Like, I think Twilight's a pretty good example where Edward and Jacob don't really have much of a relationship. They have to interact by virtue of living in the same town, being obsessed with the same girl, being monsters, yada, yada, yada. But they don't really have a relationship. Especially compared to a love triangle like in The Challengers. We have this really amazing, proper, juicy, steamy, sweaty love triangle in The Challengers. With Tashi, Patrick, and Art. Where the love goes in every direction. And them wanting different things out of each other. And as far as themes and messaging goes, we get a real explicit indication of it. When Tashi says that, Tennis is a relationship because what's proven even more so that's even more true is that a relationship is tennis and she's the ball played between Art and Patrick. This is the running parallel of the whole movie. She's not being played. She's being played with. She's the one playing with them. We well, could also argue the ball is in control of what's happening on the field too. If you can control it with your racket. The no. The metaphor is clear and it's clearly stated. It's not clear and it is not clearly stated to me. We're introduced to Tashi and she's immediately infatuating to the boys. And then there's this weird focus on her response to, you know, owning someone at tennis. She orgasms. We don't 
know exactly what that is until the end explicitly, but it's kind of built up throughout the entire third act with how quickly we go back and forth between her, Tashi, being with Patrick and Art. There's just kind of this back and forth, like tennis. And there's this intensity that builds with these two players who are, you know, as good as it gets at the game of Tashi tennis. So, of course, you don't really know how it's going to go. And then that's, you know, drug out and teased in that last, what, maybe 10 minutes of the slow-mo crazy camera shots and stuff. Obviously hinting at just the nature of sex. And the balls really run home when Tashi orgasms from the audience stands when they're actually playing tennis because they're actually like playing her in those moments. So is this what this movie is? Yes. That's it? It's less of a movie about tennis and more about... Well, yeah, I think that's very obvious that it's less of a movie about tennis. But more about this ecstasy and obsession that comes with kind of being at the center of a winning moment. And so, yes, Tashi is constantly using art and Patrick, but she's also not a real character. She's kind of surrealistic. The other two are a little more grounded and likable, I guess, or at least, you know, up until the end, maybe. But Tashi is mentally ill, no doubt about it, in a, in a real setting. But it's really just them. They are the center of this universe. It's a little bit lame. It's lame. <laughs> it's a little bit lame. I don't know. Well... That mixed in with the direction and performances and the masterfully crafted nature of going back and forth, I think, helps build that tension and and teasing nature of just being edged, like, sexually. It's like a super sexual movie without really having any sex in it and really no nudity. It The only nudity is, like, non completely non-sexual. Yeah. And I guess that's cool. Yeah, it goes to show you how... But there's nothing... There's no substance to this movie. Because he takes us on this adventure for way too fucking long. Just to show us a metaphor. Yeah. That's unnecessary. <laughs> that is way unnecessary. I mean, the the slow-mo was really killing me. You started off the movie with slow-mo. The introduction of this film was in slow-mo. It's the foreplay. I already knew I just wasn't in for this. It's the foreplay. And then we get the meat. Uh, okay. And then we get the edging. I understand that. And then we get the orgasm ruin. And then we finally get the orgasm. That's lame. <laughs> <laughs> and funny enough, I'm kind of there with you because... If I was one who simply cared about the perfection of like direction and vision, this would be a five out of five. But there's no way in hell this is a five out of five in my no. mind. Because mm -mm. let's start from the beginning. How does the movie start? How does it really start? They go to Atlanta, right? New Rochelle, competition, something, right? Where Patrick is at. They enter to build Art's confidence back up, to play some retirees or newbies. And they run into Patrick. That's kind of the present through line. And as they tease out that final game for the whole movie, basically, I can't believe how masterfully they managed to go back and forth present to 20, 12 years ago, present to eight years ago, present to 12 years ago, present to 12 weeks ago, present to eight years ago again. The focus on these three characters is so tight. And that's done through like, Things like, you know, Tashi's in college. Art and Tashi are in college now. The boys used to play doubles. Is that what they call it? Yes. They obviously look younger. And I see one of the hurdles. There's actually a few hurdles here to get over. My first hurdle is Zendaya being a mom. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. Why are we giving Zendaya a daughter? Well, she's old enough to have like an eight-year-old, but no, she doesn't look it. Well, yeah, okay, whatever. But why in this specific story are we giving her a daughter? Oh, to tie her to art. Just to make that harder to be separated from. Okay, why sh even show the kid? Why waste my time to see the kid if we're not even going to do anything with the kid? Well, we're not even going to have these nice moments with the kid or anything. She's just there. Bye, kid. Good night, kid. 
well, most of the movie's a flashback, right? So we don't really see much of the present anyways. But it does come full circle when we see Art sleeping with his daughter, right? There's this moment in Tashi where she was like, you know, I guess it's up for interpretation, but there's maybe this moment of if he retires from being a tennis player, maybe I can see myself with him still. It's really not all that important to the movie, but we do get that confirmation that there's more to this dynamic by just the situation that they're in than what may have kind of seemed in the first place because we're getting 90% flashback. And so, of course, Tashi and Art, no way. Tashi and Patrick, no way. Like, Tashi's kind of a terrible person as far as, like, loving and wanting to be around and stuff. I'm sure she's kind of insufferable. (laughs) One thing I really like about the structure, though, is as we get this final game slowly dealt out throughout the whole movie of two hours or so, it felt like, like a Dragon Ball Z fight or something where we just had these long monologues and maybe a little bit of Naruto in there with, you know, episode long flashbacks of just trying to build texture to how significant what is happening is. I thought that was super neat. And then the end with the crazy cinematography and just how like over the top dramatic it was. Like it wasn't really melodramatic. It was just like so over the top with him messing up on purpose, him doing Art's little tick, Tashi becoming interested, and them kind of rekindling this, you know, bromance that they once had on the court, it just screams anime to me. Yeah, I guess that was cool. And it was tied back into what Zendaya said with what Tashi said in the beginning about it being a relationship and having that like 15 second moment of pure relationship, a pure whatever, love, I don't know, just that moment in the court, whatever you have together. And that was seen here. So that was cool. It's like this transcended form of like operating with each other. Well, it was them being able to have fun with each other again. Like obviously life went too serious so quick because when they were kids, I mean, here they were in a bedroom, all three of them just having fun, like not thinking about anything, consequences, who's going to get the girl, none of that. And then that got quickly shredded. But here at the end, we finally have this moment of them letting their guard down and just being teenagers again. And also having Art finally beat Patrick. And having Art finally beat Patrick, yeah. I like I I really like the end. The end was awesome with all their like gestures and eyebrow raises and smiles. Like no one had to say anything for you to know that Zendaya was like, "Hey, bitch, you gonna throw the match or what?" And he's like, "I don't know. I don't, we'll see what I do." And then Art's like, "He's like, what's going on?" It's you like, guys have obviously have talked. About yeah, this. like does he know? Does yeah. he know they know what's happening? Like, it's yeah. just it's so it's so it intense. Good. Yes. How do you say that? but not love the meat. Uh, <laughs> it's the build up to all of that moment. It was just too slow. It was it was too slow and like some of the things just didn't make sense. What didn't like, make sense? And some of the things maybe they didn't make sense but they were kind of silly. Like why all of a sudden did we shun Patrick just because Zendaya fell and broke her knee and Patrick wasn't there after you yelled at him and you got in a fight? And then Art's just going to shun him like that? Like, okay, that's weird. And then just giving Zendaya a kid (laughs) when she's not very loving or motherly. But obviously she's big into family because we get a lot of her dad moments. And her mom is the one watching the kid. But she don't give a shit about, you know, her family unit. So I don't know, just like small little things. I agree that the kid and family thing was a little... It was the biggest hurdle because the presence of the kid really just felt like that ball and shackle to Art because she's clearly uninterested in being in that kind of relationship. But it's also not the point because it's become maybe this situationship, which is a complete non-issue to her because it's not what life is. You know, tennis is life. Right. She loves tennis. That's what's important. And that's how she gets her fix. It's like a drug to her. Yeah, so some of the other things were like, why why are we adding this? Like, okay. And that was sold on the art and Patrick kind of falling apart when he goes to college because that's a kind of stereotypical 
growing up moment. But they hated each other. It did kind of just flip at a switch when she broke her knee. That's why I'm like, okay, here's that guy in the background who's always waiting for you to break up with your boyfriend to grab you. So it didn't feel like a love triangle. It's that guy who's waiting for you to get you when you're vulnerable. Like Bella. Like when did Jacob get Bella? When Edward left her. And that's when the bottom part of the love triangle distorts a little bit. And who's on the bottom part of this triangle? Always the two going after the one. So it's Art and Patrick. Yeah. But Art and Patrick were clearly in love with each other here. Nothing was falling apart for them. But it did. College set in. This girl set in. They made it very explicit that she's a homewrecker. I thought that was hilarious. And I will say, one thing I love about sports movies, especially good ones, competitive ones, ones that ones that focus on the competition, is how erotic just the nature of competition is. And oftentimes how gay it is, especially when you have like same sexes playing each other. There's just this homoeroticness that's unlike anything else I've seen. It's it's just next level masculinity of self-indulgent and it's it's funny and it's really nice to see because it feels very human. It's a deep meditation and kind of embracement of just how in love we can be with each other without it being anything else. It's just pure love. And we see that represented here through the boys. And they do go over the top with it, with them kissing. And Tashi making them kiss only kind of sets the stage of who she is and how she likes to manipulate the situation for her weird, out-of-body, surrealistic kind of addiction. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because tennis is such a solo sport. You know, you don't play with a team. Your doubles partner is not your lifetime doubles partner it's not like you two are out to conquer the other doubles partners like no you play individual you play doubles sometimes you play co-ed but i mean yeah way to take that from tennis and make it a non-lonely feeling because other sports movies are about that teamwork and that camaraderie but here just felt like that confidence and that living your dreams and that obsession. It's kind of funny because this movie maybe unlocked something in my head that tennis is the most erotic sport because of that 1v1. Oh, and the grunts. And the grunts were very explicit. Yes. You know, I don't know if you could have read this movie any more explicit in that, especially the ma- the last match, obviously, it's it's sex. It's just hardcore animalistic sex happening on another on another plane all for tashi because there's even a moment there because even at the end with patrick and art you had this more masculine grunt and then art having this little wimpier grunt and there was like almost this top and bottom kind of thing happening i don't know about that but all telling right. you man it's it's erotic and i always felt that way about just the nature of masculinity and especially sports but this movie has put that on a whole nother level for me and and obviously other people see it luca but based off his other movies luca's already tapping into the gayness he's gonna put everybody in a gay setting no matter what it is when you can make eating your partner the most sexy thing and romantic thing you guys can do to each other nothing's off limits i guess that's true that's very true I know you mentioned the timeline being done very well and calling it a masterpiece with its tightness, but I don't know if I quite agree with that. There were some sections where I was confused on where we were, and I think it was the sections with the hotels and them looking like they look now. Zendaya's hair is short, so, you know, I lost it there. That was a big indicator for me in the beard for Patrick and they all kind of still look the same I think it was like three years before and I was a little bit lost there um and then he still had the shirt that she had on in college the I don't know it was a gray shirt said something funny on the front 
but he's obviously been wearing it for years. So I don't know. That was it. That section took me out a little bit. I don't know if it was because of them all looking too similar and kind of what was going on. Like, has she already cheated on Art before? Or, like, she had already cheated on Art before and then she was about to cheat again. So that whole cheating element was here in this section. So I was I was a bit lost on where, where we were in the timeline. Just give him a new shirt. <laughs> Like, get over it. It's time to wash your boyfriend's hoodie. Get over it. <laughs> it's been 15 years. Yeah, those kinds of serendipities and just positioning of these characters starts to make this world revolve around them. Like, nothing else matters. Like, we're not in a real world. It really is just kind of a world for these, this love triangle. Which I like a lot because... It does at moments have this like high school romance flavor to it. In a proper high school movie, it should feel like this is the world. You know, nothing else happens outside of high school. Yeah, maybe this movie is a bit too modern for me. I kind of had that feeling after too watching. Too modern. It. Yeah. <laughs> this whole like she never tells Art she loves him, but. You know, she's the tennis coach for him, so obviously there's something there. These situationships, these love triangles, these 15, 16, 18 years after college, after high school, after whatever, and you're still all pawning for each other. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm still, uh, maybe I'm just the hopeless romantic. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Because art, Art's getting screwed here. He just wants to be home. He wants to retire. He wants to be with his family. He wants to be with his daughter. He's always telling her, I love you. Does she even once say that in the whole film? No. And, okay, you saying that she's more of a surrealistic character makes it make a little bit more sense on why she's not being a decent-ass partner, which is why I think now it's lame that this whole movie is just a big euphemism. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I want more. It is just one big euphemism. Yeah. I want more. I want more out of these characters. I want to know Art a little better. What is he thinking? Quit just high schooling him and making him just be obsessed with this girl and he's going to do no matter what to get this girl. Why did he decide to go to college? We think we're getting something from her saying that, well, life's not all about tennis, but it is because you're playing with these two boys you're using art to get a tennis career without you being the one to get your tennis career because you hurt your leg. Which, that was insane, by the way. I like that quite a lot. Her knee going the other direction. That was awesome. There were some awesome bits in this movie. I just didn't like the overall what it had to say to me. Yeah, it's really not deep or potentially all that relatable in its messaging. It's deep in how it kind of shuffles itself together. Yeah, and I think that's what I meant by substance. That's what I'm missing. So it keeps me from it keeps me from completely liking this movie, and there are some other movies that I absolutely love that don't have that deep messaging or the substance, but those are things I absolutely love, like monsters, you know, even some horror films. Horror films don't have any kind of deep messaging but the suspense and the horror and the gore just get me but here it's just sex and what you said building up and foreplay and all these things it's like you know what i'm not here for this kind of movie this is this just isn't my type of movie yeah the substance here lives in the dynamics between the characters and we build their character off of kind of the negative space of what happens between them instead of learning anything about them yeah. yeah which is such an interesting way to make a movie so of course i guess it speaks to me because i'm a sucker and i can't help but to just really gush over it although i will say it of the four luca films i've seen suspiria this bones and all and call me by your name it's probably my least favorite okay but they're all highly rated in my mind. Yeah, you're definitely a fan here, for sure. Yeah, I think 
I think I said in the beginning that Lucas entered my favorite directors. With this movie, he went down a little more for me. Suspiria was... That's an awesome movie. No, it was... That's... No. That's not... That's not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to give a shout out to the camera work. Did that rotating ball at the end remind you of a specific movie? No. Oh my God. The Big Lebowski. Oh, I don't remember that movie. <laughs> I saw, that's also another movie that shouldn't be a movie. That's one of your favorites. You must have a death wish. <laughs> no, I, I don't even know if I've seen The Big Lebowski from start to finish. I think I've seen bits and pieces, so maybe I'd have to watch it, but um, I'm not quite interested. But the camera work was awesome. I'll be the first one to admit that I flinched when those balls were coming at the screen. I I flinched like three times. Oh, my God. I thought you didn't notice. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't they were, notice. They were pretty big flinches. I was like, oh, shit. And then I looked around, and since we were the only ones there, I was like, oh, thank God we were the only ones here. But there was there was a specific one that made me flinch pretty bad. I'm so surprised you didn't notice. I didn't when notice. Patrick, I think they were playing the doubles tournament, and Patrick like hit the ball in between his legs, and the ball came straight at the camera. And my ass fucking flinched. And I felt embarrassed. <laughs> but I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then it happened like two more times. Challengers and Monsters, Inc. University. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this a 3D movie? <laughs> Those last 10, 15 minutes on the back of all of this buildup are some of the best filmmaking I've ever seen. Probably in my top five sections of a movie period ever. Yes, I'll agree with you there for sure. I I was so surprised with how crazy it looked and and I was thinking how did they shoot like the camera must have been going forward while the ball was still being hit across the camera like how many cameras did you guys ruin during the production of this film Man I have to assume the ball was not even there it's CG <gasps> I have no idea I didn't even think about that <laughs> I have no idea I also want to give a shout out to how good the tennis looked. It looked pretty good. I mean, if you're a fan of the sport, which I don't know if I'm a tennis fan, I just know the rules and I know how it's played. Unlike football and I'm going to call myself out here. I don't know all the soccer rules and regulations. You're a fake Mexican. I'm a fake Mexican. I just cheer when my dad cheers, you know, but tennis is probably the only sport that I do. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like, these are actually some pretty good hits if they are the ones hitting it. In an interview I saw, they talked about all the work they were putting in, like four hours of training and whatnot, and working with like a professional tennis coach and all these really cool things. And I was pretty impressed. Not to say that other movies don't have that as well, but I could just notice it here. It's nice when they can make the sport have this power to it. And I must say... It looks better than another tennis movie we recently saw. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> I'm sure it's nice when a ball that's out actually gets called out in a movie as out. You know, it's like all these people that know very like specific detailed things about what not, you know, like the difference between your grace, your majesty, your highness mm -hmm. like the people that know the those things and then in movies they get them wrong i feel like there's something similar there i loved all those guys like around the perimeter collecting the ball and calling the outs and stuff yes they're all matching and they're doing their their job it was so awesome i loved seeing that yeah it looks so it probably is like that i have no idea but it was it was so over the top and just just nothing gets by the goalie kind of thing, you know? It's it's so tight. Yeah, and I love that they got penalties for racket. Yeah, it's awesome. What did they say? And like cussing. Yeah, and cussing. Uh, I don't know what they said about like racket abuse. I think that's what they said. And I was like, dang, he did abuse that racket though. He like smacked the shit out of it. It was so funny. And I appreciated all those little quirks and stuff. It takes itself so serious in the right way. Like the sport does, I guess. At least in the movie. It's not like, what's that stupid ass movie? Rebel Moon where... <laughs> Damn. 
Go listen to our Rebel Moon episode. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> you just have that guy in your life at school or whatever who thinks he's super cool, you know, and he takes he takes everything so serious in his own way and it's just like so over the top in the worst way possible. Yes. Yes. And then you have that cool kid that he's just so chill. He's just so he's such like a vibe. That when he takes it serious, it's like, oh, that's cool. That's this movie. Yeah. This is yeah. the cool kid. This that's is cool just kid. the... The real cool kid. Yeah. How did you feel about the music? Oh, my God. I forgot about the music. The music is awesome. It reminds me of this weird cross between Super Mario Sunshine and Silent Hill. <laughs> I was like, what is this crazy music? This is like some gay rave stuff. And it's awesome. It was awesome. It was awesome. I really like this scene a little too much because it's still in my mind. And it's this scene where they are helping each other stretch and they're pulling out each other's hands. And then one of them falls. I think the other one pushed him. And he goes like thud mm -hmm. on the ground. And oh, that I heard thud it. turned into the intro thud to the song. I was like, man. That's pretty cool. That's like one of those moments where you just feel good in that movie because of the music that made you feel good to that moment. But it was such a like an insignificant moment. You know, they were just stretching. It, oh, it, no moments insignificant in this movie. They were just stretching. <laughs> they, were just... they were stretching. All right. Oh, my God. That was cool. That was really cool. The music was cool. It was a little 80s ish, too. I like that. And then you had this other kind of weird mix of, I don't know what you call it, like opera music. I don't know. It was like some soft music too in there with other scenes. I was like, okay, that's a that's a nice juxtaposition of music. And I, I was here for it. I was here for the music. Was it a little loud? Maybe at the movie theater. I heard it peaking. We got some feedback. Oh, okay. Yeah, the speakers weren't ready for that. The sp okay, so it was a little too loud. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just know movie theaters are loud in general. I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm I'm here for it. And I love that it played a lot when Art was thinking. It was so over the top, man. It felt like that was their theme songs, and <laughs> this is what's going on in their head, and it was so, so good. That's See, that's part of the direction. There's just this tightness to this world you know it's not this drama this movie's not a drama this is this is let's have sex but let's call it tennis you know what i'm saying yeah it's different than like that movie x i can't remember who directed that t west i think with jenna ortega and and mia goth of course where there's this literal side by side parallel comparison of pornography and the nature of splatter horror it's very neat but oh. it's it's exactly what you'd expect and it's it's i mean it's a wonderful film but it's like sort of i guess pearl in a way where there's this sexualness to the action where killing turns pearl on playing tennis is sex funny thing happening in the movie world still am <laughs> i liked it get out of here kid Still lame. And the last thing I want to bring up is just something that made me laugh. It was in the scene when Tashi and Art were fighting, kind of, in their hotel room. And he's like, you know, I love you. I just need you to tell me that you'll love me no matter what. And then she said, what am I, Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> and that was hilarious. I've. It's so rare when... A movie pulls a fast one like that out, you know? Especially like that. It's so funny. This girl's such a bitch. These two guys. <laughs> yeah, talk about being charmed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. She's like a siren, you know? Just no really rhyme or reason to why they are so attracted to her. Yeah. And it it's so sad because can you imagine your partner telling you that? What am I, Jesus? After you just say... Will you love me no matter what? Because they're obviously feeling insecure and need some reassurance out of you. And then they pull that out. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. And it's savage. And I loved it. 
All right, man. Well, I hope I was able to justify why this movie's excellent. You don't need to like it. Not everything's for everyone. And I'm glad you didn't like it. I like it when we can kind of diverge. I liked it. It just was kind of mid. It just didn't hit home with me. It's not, you know, it's not a recommend this to somebody movie. Yeah, I would have a hard time recommending this movie. I'd have to know you a little bit about, you know, how you approach a movie. I can't really name anyone I would recommend this to in my life. And I wouldn't watch this again. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm i not going to say I didn't like it, though. If I said that earlier, I you know, I take it back. I liked it. It was just like, ah, I need something more. And it was kind of lame. But I guess I can't help but to say that this was a very well-made movie. And it knew what it wanted. Did I help justify why this is a great movie? Wait, okay. Did you help justify? Yes. Did you convince me? <laughs> no. All right. Well, I did my best. But thank you for watching it with me and talking about it here today. You're welcome. Do you have a budget guess for me? My budget guess is $30 million. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty comfortable price. This is the kind of movie where if I was guessing, I'd be a little intimidated guessing this price because man i i don't know you know no intimidation here well it says here that it was 55 million jesus christ a little (laughs) more than i thought it was gonna be but i just i don't know and so far it's went on to make 26.9 million dollars so not bad there's a good chance we break even okay but it just came out right yeah that's the first weekend right so yeah 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 it got time and over in Letterbox with 285,000 people, already a lot of people, where they're not going to theaters they're to see this shit, what are they? No. <laughs> they weighed in at a 4.2. A 4.2? I get it. It's a weird movie. Like, I I don't know. It's a it's an artsy fartsy movie. It is an artsy fartsy movie. Artsy fartsy movies are not fours. Not usually. They usually not float usually, in the yeah. top threes. 3.8, 3.9. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, this is going to be a big Oscar movie right now. I mean, what's it even have to compare to? Well, the rest of the year. <laughs> There's going to be a lot more stuff. A lot of the Oscar stuff comes out at the end of the year normally. Well, yeah. I mean, that's already come out that we would know about. Oh, well, that's just my <laughs> prediction. I don't I don't know. Dune will be there. I don't know what in what way, but... So Zendaya will be there one way or another. That's true. <laughs> Both her movies, very good this year very nice i gave it a 2.5 that's comfortable it i would be also intimidated to like try to shave any more off of that because it's just so it's such a complete movie yeah i feel that i don't love this movie like a clockwork orange or even monkey man but i do love it it's very amazing so it's kind of hard to score for me but I think uh, 3.5 is where I'm sticking. Mm. All right, Manuel, thanks again. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Film of Steins. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on patreon.com slash film Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and YouTube. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come subscribe for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. Come request a movie. Come request another Luca Guadagnino film. How about it? Suspiria? All right. All right, if you're paying. <laughs> but until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film of Steins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained new insights and perspectives on the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Film of Steins signing off.